The Great Depression provided a dramatic ending to the decades of unprecedented prosperity for the upper and middle classes. The disaster had been brewing for years and the nation was unprepared for a perfect storm of events that descended on the American economy. Not everyone was affected and Europe did not fare as badly as the U.S. economy. The sobering times ended the experiments with youthful looks and androgyny and heralded a return to the established ideas of the female form. Just as society will experience a large gulf between the haves and have-nots, women's fashions will feature wide gulfs from utilitarian day dresses and skirts for the average woman and a high glamour that has never been matched. American women's fashions will be heavily influenced by Hollywood movies and film producers will create promotion deals with mass manufacturers to sell styles as seen in the movies. Paris fashions will be too expensive for even the wealthy during the Depression, and American fashion industry will rise with name designers opening their own houses in New York. There's an immediate drop in the hemline from the knee lengths in 1928 that ended the last era. By 1930, the hems have dropped to the mid-calf. By 1931, the waistline shifts upward dramatically to the high waist, just under the rib cage. The legs appear to elongate with this higher waistline. The ideal figure will continue to be slender, but not in an androgynous way. Like men's fashions, the shoulder area will be emphasized with small shoulder pads and puff sleeves or draped sleeve effects. The cloche hat will disappear to be replaced by smaller hats that perch over one eye. Skirts begin to shorten again in 1937, and by 1939, the economy has recovered, and skirts again climb to where they had been in 1929, at just below the knee. Daywear will address comfort and utility, and the Depression ends changing several times per day for different events. Instead, the average woman will own a house dress or day dress to wear at home or every day. Some were even washable. She would then own a good dress and perhaps several or maybe a suit for outside the home, changing to go into town or conduct business in public. Wealthy women had never needed a house dress and they will continue to dress with more formality. Designer Coco Chanel finally gets her way and the suit permanently enters many women's wardrobes. Wealthy women wear exquisitely tailored suits as an all-day alternative for public business, shopping, lunch, or going to theater matinees. Suits are made of different fabrics to separate them as country suits or city suits. The image in the center is an example of a suit made of knitted fabrics, a direct inheritor of the Chanel tradition. Women stretch their wardrobes with separates, with Americans embracing plaids and striped tailored jackets to mix with skirts and dresses. There are two major silhouettes for women in the 1930s. Both styles are widely available through the decade. The first one is the pencil line, featuring a long, lanky silhouette that flatters young women or slender women. It features a high natural waist, shoulders that are wider than the hips but are not overly emphasized, a straight pencil skirt with a perhaps a slight widening at the hem. One element that made the pencil line so alluring is the bias grain, a way of engineering the fabric when constructing a dress. Most garments are cut along the straight of grain or following the edges of the fabric. As you can see on the right, if you fold fabric along a 45 degree angle, the diagonal or hypotenuse of the resulting triangle is the bias grain. 
The dress on the left shows how bias grain will cling to the body and fall as a slender column. While not all pencil line garments are made with the bias cut, many were and it is a hallmark of the 1930s look. Making an entire dress from bias cut fabric is extremely expensive and one of the most difficult sewing jobs there is. The popularity of bias cut dresses in the 1930s is credited to Parisian couturier Madeleine Vionnet. Vionnet opened her house in 1912, devising methods of using the bias cut during the 1920s, but ushering in the drapey, figure-hugging, liquid glamour of the 1930s. She also excelled in garments that evoked classical grease with flutes and draping. She believed women's clothing should move with the body, and she famously said, when a woman smiles, her dress should smile with her. She eliminated stiff girdles and padding, promoting the natural shape of women. Although her designs appeared simple, they required sophisticated engineering and precision. It is easy to see the influence of streamlined modern styling in these slinky, shiny fashions. The second silhouette is the X shape. The shoulder is wider than the hip, a slender hip is featured, and then the skirt that flares out at the hem in a bell shape or an A-line. One hallmark of the X shape is wide or full sleeve treatments, such as full upper sleeves, capelets, ruffles, and puffed sleeves. Sleeves that widen the shoulders compared to the hip are part of the X shape and these styles particularly favor matronly or mature figures or give the impression of being more mature. As a matter of fact, one of the signature looks for the 1930s fashion is complex sleeves. There's an endless variety of sleeves in this era and later designers will return to the 1930s to find inspiration. Another signature is complex seaming and dressmaker details in the whole dress. It is a golden era of modern women's dressmaking, combining tailoring and feminine details. Even affordable dresses will feature details inspired by couture designs. A third signature is combining triangular or diamond shapes into the seaming or a vertical emphasis. On the left, we see a use of positive and negative space creating triangular shapes. One new use for triangular shapes is a new neckline called a halter neckline. The back of a halter neckline is left open, creating a new erogenous zone, the bare back. This is one area of skin that had not been featured in past fashions. A fourth signature look for the decade is knitted fashion. Once Chanel introduced stretch knit fabrics in the 1920s, the trend flourished in the 1930s. Knitted dresses were one way to provide a fitted pencil line without as much careful tailoring as the knit is stretchy. Women embrace the sweater top, which could be made with collars and blouse-like details. This stretches a woman's wardrobe affordably and provides comfort. Sweaters in this period can be dressed up or down for different occasions, another aspect that Chanel would approve of. 1930s sweaters end at the waist or just below with a knitted band, and they can be belted at the waist. Women add trousers to their sports and casual wardrobes. Seen routinely now for work or play, it is still too controversial to wear them for social occasions or business, and many institutions, such as schools and churches, don't allow women to wear them. Warm weather resorts, such as Monaco and Palm Beach, Florida, are now the new hotspots for the wealthy elite to congregate to escape winter weather. In the 1920s and 30s, designers created a fifth season in addition to the four we know. 
The new one is called a resort collection and it provides summer fashions in the middle of winter for those who will travel for a vacation or to a second home. By the end of the decade, the fitted bathing suit is available. Notice the hip portion is made with a false skirt called a modesty panel. We now see most of the leg and much more skin. The bathing suits feature a woman's natural shape. Catalina Swimwear, a California company, rises to national prominence creating more bare bathing suits and featuring Hollywood stars in their advertisements. This is another example of how California affects American fashion, making inroads especially into beach fashions. The fashions of the 1930s leave behind the boyish bodies of the 1920s, instead celebrating the natural female form under the influence of Paris Couturier, v &A, and the desire to look more adult. Underwear does not change from the 1920s with one-piece and two-piece styles available. They will fit more closely to the body, however, reflecting the body-conscious fit of many dress styles. Most women wore a girdle for support or to smooth the figure under slender fashions, much like women wear Spanx today. It was considered racy to jiggle when a lady walked, so even women who did not need support compressed their figures with girdles. Interestingly, at a time when many faced dire economic straits, fur becomes an overt luxury fashion. Furs take on very large proportions, putting an emphasis on the shoulders and around the face. Bulky or lofty furs are the favorites, animals with long, luxurious hair. Furriers now sew the pelts together to create long lines of stripes. We also develop the idea of spring or even summer furs. As you can see on the right, a woman wearing a light summer dress and white fur. Luxurious furs were featured in Hollywood movies. Studio boss Adolf Zukor, the founder of Paramount, worked as a furrier in New York before coming to California. He always included over-the-top furs in his films to lend glamour. The average woman could not afford these luxurious furs. Furs trickled down to their wardrobe as large collars that were added to cloth coats. In 1931, Jean Harlow starred in a movie titled Platinum Blonde, turning what was an earlier trend into a fashion craze. The double process blonding had been available in the late 1920s, but was not always successful and could burn the hair. In the 1930s, it was successful and a new color was born. Long hair returns styled to frame the face with waves or curls. The makeup technique continues that creates an artificial eyebrow that is long and has a relatively flat arch. Millinery is very expensive because it is so labor intensive. During the depression, hat styles shrink or freeze into styles a woman could wear for several years. The cloche hat of the 1920s updates to a slouch hat, a close-fitting crown now worn at an angle. 1930s hats will generally tilt over one eye. Three hat styles here sit on top of the head, also tilting over an eye. Toque hats resemble upside-down flower pots, and sometimes they are called flower pot hats. Perch or pert hats sit on top of the head. Funnel hats, seen on the right, form a point at the top. Flat hats resemble pancakes that tilt to one side, and there are fanciful hats that resemble bird wings. Berets and pillbox hats are very affordable for everyday women. Berets can even be uh, knitted at home. 
Veiling is added to some hats to shade the face. This was widely used in the movies to soften mature faces in harsh sunlight. Shoes remain the same styles as the 1920s, but take on a very signature rounded silhouette in the 1930s. The back of the heel counter forms a chunky roundness, and the toes are also round. We have a new shoe style called a mule that has no heel, so the foot slides in. These have not been in fashion as streetwear since the 18th century. And we have a brand new style of shoe called a wedge created by designer Ferragamo in Italy. It is very popular for resort wear and it was quickly adapted by all women. In the 1920s, drag balls and masquerades became an important part of establishing and maintaining LGBTQ culture. In Harlem, the culture of drag balls and masquerades referred to themselves as part of a pansy craze, and Harlem had a number of gay-friendly bars and floor shows. Balls gained more public visibility after they attracted cisgender writers and artists, and they were an open secret in the art and entertainment world. Speakeasies openly featured drag acts and both male and female impersonators acting as the MC would in doing what we would today call stand-up comedy. The persona of the high camp, witty, obviously gay man was invented by some of the most famous MCs in New York. Most famously, Jean Malin, whose MC act was copied all over New York. Tensions with the police heightened in the 1930s. Those who were willing to look the other way in the Roaring Twenties no longer did so in the 30s. After repeated raids in New York, some of the most famous female impersonators and MCs fled to Hollywood, where some briefly tried film careers. After the police in Los Angeles decided to crack down, some fled to Paris and Berlin, both meccas of relaxed attitudes. One person who was more successful translating ball and masquerade culture to mainstream entertainment was Mae West, who began her career as a male impersonator. She was a playwright who wrote about gay culture, and her views were remarkably progressive. She battled censorship and arrest much of her life. She became one of the most controversial movie stars of the 1930s. She made fun of conventional sexual mores. She made a very successful career out of quips and behaviors, many in the know, associated with gay MC performers. I can't help but notice a resemblance of, of personas here and some of the comedy material of Mae West to the great Jean Malin, and I, I wonder if she was channeling him. Fashions in the 1930s were heavily influenced by the movies, particularly in America. The American fashion world split into two realms, New York and Hollywood. New York followed Paris much more closely, considering Hollywood over-the-top and vulgar. Those willing to spend money on clothing began to patronize new American designers such as Hattie Carnegie and Mainbacher. Women's fashions in the 1930s addressed two polar opposites. One version provided a large array of utilitarian dresses, skirts, and suits that a woman could wear to many functions or at home. The other was high glamour, evident in suits, dresses, and evening wear. Both approaches feature dressmaker details that future designers will look back to for inspiration.